Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and it's, um, it's great for me to be able to join all of you here today and for the next few days as we go through this conference. Um, you know, it's, although I've been here before, uh, it's special to be able to join everyone here in Delhi at this conference and, and to meet with my counterparts from other nations, especially my colleagues at the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO. Uh, who have had so, much, so many recent amazing successes. Gatherings like this remind me that space exploration and the critically important task of studying our home planet are global undertakings. We are undeniably stronger through our partnerships. No single nation can build every instrument, launch every satellite, or perform all the research and engineering that it takes to understand the entire Earth system, or to travel to other destinations in the solar system and beyond. Working together, however, we can advance knowledge of our planet, our solar system, our sun, and our universe for all humanity. You'll hear later from Dr. Michael Freilich, director of NASA's Earth Science Division, about our key Earth science programs and objectives and the many benefits to all of us living on the planet from our Earth observations from space. But I'd like to take just a few moments um, to talk about some of our recent and upcoming mission highlights and describe how our understanding Earth science program uh, relates to our agency's, our outstanding Earth science program relates to our agency's broader mission. And um, you'll see a number of slides pop up behind me over the course of this. I'm not gonna address them. They're for your entertainment, so you don't have to watch me. And uh, I, would I would invite you to enjoy the, the photos because they are mostly of our planet, although some of them actually are of uh, various parts of our universe that have been collected not just by NASA, but through NASA's collaboration with many of you in this room. So I thought I would allow you to, uh, to enjoy them as I talk. Our Earth observations work focuses on satellite and suborbital flight missions research and analysis of the data from those missions, and an applied sciences program that works to turn our measurement and our research into immediate societal benefits in areas such as agriculture and disaster response and mitigation. In addition to the roughly 20 Earth-observing research satellites NASA currently has in orbit, you may not realize that we also are using instrumented airplanes as well as the International Space Station as platforms to study our own planet. It turns out that the space station is a very useful platform for targeted studies and for testing new mission concepts. Since instruments can be launched to the ISS on cargo resupply missions and installed robotically and operated by the astronauts on board. Uh, interestingly, when Dr. Mike Freilich and I got together about almost seven years ago, and I asked the question, can we put Earth science instruments on station? Mike said, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people said no because it just wasn't the right platform. It wasn't at the right altitude. It wasn't in the right orbit. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. But I think today, uh, through the work of Dr. Freilich and his team, we've demonstrated that not only is it a good platform, but it is an optimal platform from the standpoint of cost effectiveness. Uh, when we send something to the International Space Station today, uh, as opposed to it being a, uh, a standalone uh, launch that costs a lot, uh, it usually is packed away somewhere in the trunk of a SpaceX Dragon or another cargo module, and it gets installed on the station robotically uh, by a folk down on the ground so we don't have to send astronauts out to do a spacewalk, and it is turning out to be a uh, benefit to all of us. And, and I'll talk a little bit about them, and Mike, Mike actually will talk a little bit more about some of the instruments that are on station today. Since January of 2015, for example, the Cloud Aerosol Transport System, or CATS, aboard the station has used LIDAR to provide near real-time measurements of atmospheric aerosols and clouds to help us better understand climate change through data about the makeup, structure, and evolution of Earth's atmosphere. NASA's RapidScat instrument, also on the ISS, monitors ocean surface wind speed and direction to provide essential measurements used in weather predictions including monitoring phenomena like hurricanes, El Nino, and monsoons. On Earth, human exploration came first, 
followed by measurements from airborne and spaceborne platforms. As we turn our gaze outward toward the sun, the planets, and our solar system, the planets beyond our solar system, and indeed to the whole universe, satellites are leading the way for human explorers. The remote sensing technologies we use in our fleet of Earth observation satellites are also helping us to explore Mars and other planets in the solar system, and often we find that discoveries we make on other planets can provide insights to aid in our understanding of Earth. Perhaps the best example of that interchange relates to our journey to Mars. I'm happy to report that NASA continues to make great progress on the journey, which has been building in real terms for the past 50 years since our first flyby of the planet with a Mariner spacecraft. Mars has been at the horizon of our exploration future since humanity first looked to the stars. Mars can teach us about our own planet's formation and possible future, and it may also be a place where we find life besides Earth. We haven't given up on that yet, and in fact, we've just begun to hit our stride in the search for other life in the universe. The things we are learning about other planets, for example, how Mars's atmosphere disappeared and where its water is, are informing our study of our home planet, even as they help us get humans ready to safely uh, get them safely to the red planet and possibly to make home there as well. We're closer to Mars than we have ever been in human history. Not only with the fleet of orbiters and rovers currently there and the InSight lander and Mars 2020 rover coming in the next few years, but also with our mindset, our philosophy, and our plans. Working closely with our international partners from Kness and DLR, the InSight lander is now planned for 2018, and its primary goal is to help us understand how rocky planets, including Earth, formed and evolved. The MOXIE instrument aboard the Mars 2020 rover will produce oxygen from Martian atmospheric carbon dioxide, yet another step in helping us perfect in situ resource utilization technologies so that we can eventually live off the land while humans arrive. I should also point out that both of these missions involve international collaboration. Today, the human journey to Mars continues in low Earth orbit, where the International Space Station is teaching us how to live and work in space over long periods of time. We're relying on the innovations and commercial partnerships to develop the cargo and crew transportation systems that will help expand access to space for NASA, as well as other agencies, other nations, academia, and industry. As we move through the 16th year of continuous human habitation aboard the International Space Station with international crews, I'm delighted by how many nations are using the station, more than 80 at last count, and how broad the base of the research community has become. Our commercial partners are helping us expand access to station. The recent orbital ATK cargo resupply mission to the station delivered a 3D printer for manufacturing in space and many experiments, including one to examine meteors from orbit. The next SpaceX launch, targeted for April 8th, uh, will include the BEAM expandable habitat, a student DNA experiment, and other research to benefit our journey to Mars. From low Earth orbit and the Earth-reliant ISS, we'll move to the proving ground of the vicinity of our moon. We'll use our Space Launch System rocket and the Orion spacecraft for missions around the moon and to an asteroid, and these missions will help us refine vital technologies like solar electric propulsion, radiation shielding, habitats, and other capabilities we'll need for missions to the Mars neighborhood. For all intents and purposes, the astronauts will be Earth independent once they set out for Mars, because there's no rapid resupply possible, and what we need on those missions we'll have to take, make, or send ahead. Technology drives exploration, and it's helping us solve many of our key challenges to getting to Mars. We're going to continue investments in things like space-to-ground laser communications, satellite servicing, habitation concepts, and advanced in-space propulsion. 
You may not immediately see the connections between these and life on Earth or Earth science, but as we enable humans to live in the harsh environments that exploration requires, these connections will become evident as we learn to keep satellites healthier and communicating far longer. The public is engaged in our work. The tally of 18,300 astronaut applications NASA received at the close of our call last month is testament to that. But even more, everywhere I travel, I meet amazing young people who want to join us. And that's all around the world. And by us, I mean the broad community of explorers across this planet. They are scientists, engineers, spacecraft designers, artists, and young leaders of all types. I meet young people who tell me they want to be an Earth scientist. They want to fly new kinds of space vehicles, or they want to travel to Mars. Anyone with the willingness to put their intellect and curiosity and passions on the line to improve life on this planet and help us learn about the wider universe in which we reside is someone we need on our team. We've had an incredible couple of years expanding knowledge and progressing toward the next giant leaps in technology, science and human exploration. From New Horizons close flyby of Pluto last July to Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko completing a one-year mission aboard the International Space Station just last month. From the detection of flowing water on Mars to the discovery that planets are common around stars in our galaxy. From first ever measurements of interactions between the sun and our Earth's magnetic fields to scientifically valuable and aesthetically majestic Hubble images of star formation regions, we've captured the interest of people worldwide. <coughs> Just in the next few months, we'll see Ju the Juno spacecraft arrive at Jupiter and enter a polar orbit of our giant neighbor, studying the big planet in detail at the same time as it demonstrates the use of solar power at the farthest distance from the sun yet. OSIRIS-REx launches later this year to travel to an asteroid Bennu and bring back a sample of that asteroid to Earth. Among NASA's other top priorities, we're going to launch the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to Hubble in 2018. We've installed the 18th and final primary mirror segment, and the telescope is now optically complete. We've also completed cryogenic testing on its science cameras and spectrographs. We also will begin mission formulation for the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, or WFIRST, which would launch after the Webb Telescope, and we're entering the formulation phase of a mission to Jupiter's moon Europa, one of the top candidates for life in our solar system, because it has an abundance of water under its ice shell. These and many other science missions will continue to inspire and fire imaginations. Perhaps the most important thing that all this work provides is inspiration for young people to become the next generation of scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and technologists. They are what I like to call the space generation, and they want to make their own giant leaps in exploration. They're going to be the first boots on Mars, and we're going to make it possible for them to succeed. They'll have our next big rocket that will carry astronauts to deep space, the Space Launch System, or SLS, the Orion spacecraft in which those astronauts will travel, and the ground systems that will support it all. These systems have all passed critical design reviews, and we're moving into design and manufacture. The space generation also understands how critical it is to keep studying our home planet and using the technologies we develop to explore other worlds, to become better stewards of our own. They know that our planet is a fragile oasis in the blackness of space, but also that there is an amazing community of explorers all across the world working to make it a better place. I'm so pleased that nations of all sizes and philosophies are embracing exploration. Whether they have their own space agency or not, the voices in the dialogue are growing. The partnerships are getting stronger, and I have no doubt that the coming decades will find us with new capabilities to explore, 
human beings at new and farther destinations, a greater understanding of our home planet, and greater unity among humanity. We are on an incredible journey together today, a journey of breathtaking exploration, and that is probably the greatest thing that exploration does. It brings us together. I look forward to the discussions and deliberations of this conference, and I hope you all continue to remain excited about turning science fiction into science fact and making the impossible possible. Thank you very much.